So today we're going to be talking about, I'm going to do, I'm actually going to do a lot of drawing today. But we're going to be talking about entry strategies. And entry strategies is simply, how do you get your products to an, into another country? What, what are some strategies? Now, we already know import-export. You can just ship your products over to another country. You can export. You can import, which means that, let's say, for example, you want to do drop shipping. I don't know how many of you are, know about drop shipping, but... That's essentially importing products from overseas. A lot of people import a lot of cheap products from China and they get their license to import volume. And you know, you can get products uh, very cheaply in China per unit. And then you can go on Amazon, you can open up a store and you can say you get something that costs 12 cents. You might be able to sell it for five bucks, 10 bucks. And if you get that volume, people are making lots of money doing this drop shipping. Now, I'm not suggesting that is, you know, the way to go uh, one way or the other, but uh, it is certainly a trend. You find a lot of people engaging in these Amazon stores and importing these products from China. And these are cheap products. As I said, it might be a mouse pad. It might be these little gadgets that you put inside of your mask you know, to keep the mask from collapsing. Uh, it might be something for the house. Use these little uh, anchor anchor screws that I just bought that came from China. Um, just a lot of little stuff. And then of course your margins, um, you make a big margin off of these products. So the idea of being able to import and export is where countries are able to get their um, their revenue. Now, obviously, in trade, you've got a lot of differences in when you do business domestically, you already know the laws, you know the rules, you know the culture, you know everything, most of what there is to know about doing business domestically. But then when you go abroad, you got all of these issues. First of all, you have a, a, a certain risk profile because when you go overseas, you have different, uh, different rules, different laws, different financial situation like we saw in Har Harlan Brandon because of the financial situation. You got different labor, labor situation, different climate, different geographic infrastructure. Uh, so there's a serious uh, risk that you're taking when you go overseas. The potential financial loss that entrepreneurs are willing to take in a business, uh, taking a business is the risk profile. So of course you do the risk versus reward, the trade-off, you assess it, you do your research, you uh, look at the some of the tables I showed you like Transparency International, and then you make the jump or not and decide how you want to approach it and to what level. You might say, okay, I just want to export. I don't actually want to set up a factory over there. I'm just going to export for now. And if things get good, then I can go over there and I can maybe set up an operation, take advantage of their cheaper labor, and then establish an anchor market. And once I go where the production is, then I can ship to those locally. And then from that, that territory, I can then ship to countries that are um, by the border, you know, in, in the sur surrounding areas. So this is, this is very serious because, of course, most of us are not, we're not um, knowledgeable of many of these countries. And so we have to um, kind of mitigate the risk uh, any way we can. And, but, here you have a table that shows you the degree of risk. Importing and exporting is low risk. You export these things, these widgets, 
And if people don't buy them, it's okay, I'll find another market. And you continue until you find a captive market. Or you import from, let's say, Latin America or Asia. You're importing from Mexico. If the items don't sell, you just move on. You have not really invested a lot. Now, all the way at the other end, a wholly owned foreign subsidiary. What is that? What is a subsidiary? What is a subsidiary? It's not subsidy, it's subsidiary. So what is a wholly owned foreign subsidiary? If you can explain it in uh, basic terms. Isn't it like a, um, like a, I don't know how to say it in proper form, but like a- No, just spit it out. Just spit it out. Whatever way it comes out, that's the, you know, just go with it. Like it's under a parent company. Like there's going to be a bigger, larger company over it, like Google and then all the businesses that Google runs. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. Now, in this case, it's a foreign subsidiary. So- In that case, that means you have invested in that company. And one of the ways that if we talk about getting your products into another country, and I'll draw a diagram and we'll go through the dynamics. But one of the, if you have the money, one of the, um, I won't say safest because it's risky, but one of the, the ways in which you can mitigate your risk is that if you buy a foreign entity, that company has already vetted that country. They've already, they understand the culture, they understand you know, the environment that they're in. So you don't have to do the research. You acquire that company, then they can teach you how to best take advantage of, of that, that surrounding market. You just own the company, you might own 51%, but your partner will kind of lead the initiative in, in terms of making sure that um, you know the, this um, business is, is stays um, stays productive and profitable. And it is um, is different from what Cheetos did in the first case where they established a joint venture here. They got with a company and in a joint venture, they, they established a separate company. And then that company was managed by both, probably a 50-50 split. And so you have a lot of various um, levels of uh, entry strategies. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to draw some things and kind of explain um, how all of this works. And so let's see. Hold on one second. Okay, so if we're doing business overseas, or if we wanna do business overseas, we have, this is us, that's an A. (laughs) And we want to find another market. 
So let's say that market is here in country, or let's say this is uh, country A, country B. Now, if we want to do business with country B, and that's, let's say it's thousands of miles away, what is the most efficient way to get your products from point A to point B? What is it? Are you all there? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So what's the most efficient way? Airplane shipping. Shipping. Okay, you're ahead of me. Straight, right? The right line. line. That wasn't a trick question. It was just a basic question. Now, of course, you can't always go via straight line. And there are a lot of reasons. And sometimes the reasons ha have to do with, um, of course, reasons might have to do with geography. It might have to do with terrain. Um, and what I mean by that is you could have a situation where you have mountains, you've got body of water here, you've got trees, or you might have a situation that's, that's not paved. It might be uh, just a dirt road. But that dirt road I mean, if some of you have been to these countries on the dirt, dirt roads, those are not nice to ride on. They're not very nice. Uh, because not only are they not paved, but sometimes when, when it rains, they're impassable. Your vehicles get stuck, and then not, now you have a big problem here. So we know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So that is, um, that is our geographic distance. But what about our economic distance? Our economic distance may entail me figuring out a way to go around, around these barriers here in the middle and getting to point B. So that is an economic distance. And it may entail several stops. Maybe you have to stop here. Maybe when you get here to the port, you have to go to another part. And that might be through your truck, truck cargo that you see on the expressway. So you have all of these different points along the way that represent your economic distance. Now, one of the most efficient ways of transport we all know is air. So you have air cargo, which has um, the benefit of being very fast, but what is the trade-off? Fast, but what? So you have road, you have rail, you have the sea. So this would be sea out here. You can go the waterway, you can go via road, you can fly, or you can do rail. So if you have a rail, a lot of times that rail line cuts across 
that rail line cuts across these barriers or go there are tunnels where there might be some kind of a, a bridge, some kind of a bridge here that allows uh, where they call them in Chicago, they call them viaduct that you um, go under or an overpass. But the issue here, the air cargo is fast, but expensive. Now, in what situations would you use air cargo over, say, the um, sea cargo? Priority shipping, almost, like when it needs to get there next day. Okay. And what kind of products would that be? Any, any specific products? Has to get there fast. That's the only thing I can think of, food. Okay. So typically, perishable products or time sensitive. I mean, you, 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 you really, uh, this is gonna be your most efficient way. But again, you got the issue of the expense of going through, um, you know, air cargo. Now, air cargo is is um, it's it's a very um, it's a very well oiled machine in terms of uh, you know the different ports and uh, even the airports that um, we fly out of. Some of them have cargo special runways for cargo and um, but of course you pay for the 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 um, the speed just like you do if you mail a letter or a package if you want priority mail or if you want express mail then you pay this 2495 or whatever it is now uh, because they make a guarantee that it'll be there the next day so that's a good thing but if you are on a budget, you can go sea cargo, which may be a bit slower. And if you go sea cargo, it's slower, but cheaper. So if you're going, let's say you're going to the, um, you're going to Latin America or you're going to the Caribbean, that's relatively close. So you don't have to, um, even, even with perishable items, you're close enough that you, you may not have to worry about uh, spoilage or any other type of ish, climatic issues there was a case, and in fact, it had to do with Latin America. And I can't remember where I read it. It might have been a trade magazine. But there was a, a company, they were shipping pineapples. And these pineapples, I believe, were coming from Latin America and going to the United States or going somewhere further, further west. And in shipping this by sea, they miscalculated the current. So their cargo ship was going against the current that time of year. And because it went against the current, it took the ship uh, many hours long. I think it took um, additional days because they were going against the, against the current. And by the time the cargo got to its destination, all the pineapples had spoiled. They couldn't, they couldn't sell them. Uh, but I mean, how would you know that 
the tide is going to be, you're, you're going to be going against the tide at that time of season. That's something that you probably wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't imagine. Um, but again, you, you look at the, the mode of transport based upon uh, certain conditions uh, that you have. And of course, proximity is a big one. If you're shipping goods to, to China, you certainly are not going to use the sea cargo because that would take months perhaps, uh, and you don't want to go that route. So you have all of these different um, relay. It's almost like a relay race. If you're at A here and you're going to B, and let's say you take an airplane, uh, you might have situations, unfortunately, where you have a, let's say this is country C, and country A and country C don't get along. And they will say, you cannot fly over my airspace. So country C says, you can't fly over my airspace. This is my airspace. Since we don't get along, I'm not, I'm not giving you clearance. Now you have to go this way. Otherwise, they'll shoot you down. They'll, they'll, they'll intercept your plane and force you down or shoot you down. And of course, you see your economic distance is going to be a lot greater than if you were able to just go straight through. So you have to assess those as well. You have to assess whether country B is landlocked. What does landlocked mean? A landlocked country? You got country B and then all other, you got all these other nations that border it. So it can be country C here, country D, E, F. These are all countries that border country B. And country B does not have a port. Well, it, it doesn't have a, a seaport. So if you're shipping, if you have a friendly relationship with country E, then you can get your goods here to one of the ports. And then from there, you can then get your goods to country B. But it's landlocked, so you're at kind of a disadvantage because now you have to go to another country uh, or you have to fly over, you have to fly over a country. And in this case, country C, we were not on good terms. And so that was a, that was a drawback. Okay, so we're talking about uh, import export. There are some other options that you have. We're at a quarter to three. Let's say you don't want to deal with all these barriers. And let's even say that you don't have this situation with a, a hostile country in between, but you do have another issue. And that issue is that you have barriers in between. You have both tariff and you have non-tariff barriers in between two countries. Now you can still get to this country, but then you got, what's a tariff? What is a tariff? Yeah, tax. Right? It's just tax. Yeah, it's tax. So, what is non-tariff? It's when you aren't taxed. Is what? I mean. Okay, one example. Let me just give you this example so we can keep moving. One non one non tariff barrier could be a quota, 
which is what? A quota is, in a word, what would that be? If somebody assesses a quota against you. Isn't it a limit? It's a limit, right? So this, this is a limit. They're saying, if you want to bring your uh, products in this country, you can do so, but only up to a certain amount. That's a barrier. There are also other barriers like local content requirements. If you want to bring your goods into my country, you have to buy from local suppliers. You have to somehow do, do business lo locally. You have to have some kind of partnerships so that we can benefit from this, this, um, this activity. Um, and, and, but typically that is, that is when you're, you're producing products. That's when you're producing products and then uh, shipping them. Because they wanna be able to say that this is made with um, materials from country B, because that makes it seem like it's local. It's a it's better branding. If if people there saw that this is made in country B, and it's a high quality product that they can't get anywhere else, then they, they might have um, more. I guess they might have a more of a, a feeling to buy it because they think that they will assume that it's local. Because it says made with, let's say for example, if you're shipping. Um, fruit juice, some kind of special juice to a country. And they say you have to buy your grapes locally. Okay. You buy, oh, you buy grapes locally. They can put on the bottle or you can put on a bottle made with locally grown grapes. And so people there would say, oh, well, this is this is a local product. In actuality, it's not a local product. It is is. It's another, it's uh, the origin is a foreign country, but then you're making it with local materials, which can be a good thing. There are also other issues such as sanitation, sanitation requirements. You got other quality requirements um, that you may have to meet. So all of these are barriers you have uh, administrative delays. Uh, through paperwork and red tape. So these are all barriers that you have to deal with. You're not putting red for it because it's, you know, kind of these things that you don't like to see, but um, these are all barriers that you might say, well, I really don't want to deal with all that because it's just too much, the taxes, and they're not really fair to foreign companies uh, coming in. There might also be a, a situation that says that you can't repatriate your, um, your capital. Like when you make money here, let's say you have a sales office. Let's make this white because we're, let's say company A has a sales office here and you're making profits, and those profits are in a bank, they might say, country B might say, well, you can't take those profits out of your bank and ship them back to your country all at one time. You, the, there's only a certain amount of capital that you can take out of the country. And they're doing that because they want to make sure that uh, banks rely on capital flows and access to capital in order to lend out and invest and, you know, and, and grow. And if you take all your money out as a foreign entity and send it back overseas, it's no longer circulating in the system. So sometimes they'll have limits to how much you can uh, take out in, in terms of um, your capital. So you might say, man, this is too much. This is too much to deal with. I don't want to deal with it, all these barriers. I'm going to try to to somehow get around these barriers. And then you decide, why don't I just establish a company here within country B? 
So I have my own company. Let's just call it ABC Corporation. This is my company is registered there. And now I'm doing business. I don't have to worry about all of these barriers in between. Now, when you do this, there's still some issues you have to face. And what are some of those issues? If you're a foreign, this is a foreign business here. You're in country B. What are some of the issues you have to deal with? You're not going to escape. I mean, you escape the tariffs, but maybe still some of the non-tariff barriers you still have to deal with. But what are some of the other barriers or some of the other issues you have to deal with being in a foreign country? You got a business in country B and you have to deal with these other issues. Sometimes there are cultural barriers. Cultural. Very good. What else? Political, legal, financial, getting access to capital. Environmental. Economic, environmental. You have other issues like um, competitive, Sometimes the rules are stacked against foreign businesses. You come in and they have all these rules you have to follow. Uh, and not only that, they will give advantages to competition. Say this is one, two, three corporation. And let's say uh, this company, one, two, three, is, is a, a native company. They're going to give this company uh, an advantage over you because they want to support their national uh, industries. And so that might be a competitive issue. There might be all kinds of barriers. And again, we talked about red tape and bureaucracy uh, and even in some cases, nepotism. You have government officials might say, oh, we wanna, we, we wanna give um, you know, people we know, our friends first dibs at getting this contract instead of this foreign entity. So you might think, oh, well, this is unfair. I'm in an environment and they're not even playing fair. Uh, I can't even compete. Not only that, they're given subsidies. So country B can give one, two, three subsidies. Meaning they give them grants, low interest loans. They give them technical assistance. So you, you, you don't escape fully. I mean, you, you escape this here, but you, you still, you got all these issues that you're dealing with. Uh, you've got distributive issues. How do you get your products from point A to point B within the country? So those are issues. Geography, which deals with climate, climatic conditions. Is it damp? Is it uh, dry? Uh, are you at high altitude, low altitude? What is the situation? So these are all issues you have to deal with. So you don't escape. You just have a different set of issues that you're dealing with. But let's say that you're kind of savvy and you understand that you might be going up, um, climbing up a hill or um, trying to establish your operations in country B. So then you decide, well, since I'm having all these barriers and issues, then why don't I just try to buy this company? Why don't I buy one, two, three? That's my competitor, right? Why don't I buy the company? So let's say I get a 51% interest in one, two, three. This company knows everything about country B because they've been doing business for years. That benefits you. This country A, now this is your company. You take on the brand name, you take on the inventory, you take on the management, the labor, the structure, everything else. And you may tell them, well, okay, keep your name, keep everything the way it is. But 
we want to get our products through your supply chain. So now these products go in the supply chain of one, two, three, and they're able to get into different parts of the country. Now you would not normally have had access to all those different markets if you had done it on your own, but since you brought this company, you're using their supply chain in order to you know, move your ABC products through 123's supply chain. So that can be in the form of a buyout where you, where you have a controlling interest. It can also be an, another, so this is acquisition. So on the chart, you'll see foreign acquisition uh, in the book, but there's something else you can do. Let's say, well, you don't buy it, but you talk to one, two, three, and you said to, to one, two, three, that, well, I'm, you know, I have a business and uh, I understand that you have a similar business. So uh, how about um, we go and establish a joint venture? And we go in 50-50 and we call the business ABC123. So it's jointly owned. This is a new company, 50-50 joint venture. Now, of course, the investment is less than before because before you owe 51%, which means when you invest uh, overseas, there's a risk incurred because frankly, sometimes when you buy a company, there are hidden problems. There are all kinds of hidden problems. There might be hidden problems in terms of the um, quality, the quality standards that they already have. There may be training you need to do. There may be, you know, even outstanding debts. You buy that company, you take on the debt. So maybe by saying, okay, you might even take 49%. That's not bad. Let's say you take a 49% stake. In fact, some governments will not allow you to have a majority stake. They will not allow you to have a majority stake. Any joint venture has to be majority owned by the native, by, by the uh, home company. So let's say it's 4951, you're still gaining access to this market. Uh, and you have a partner who's gonna help you to exploit these um, channels. So that's a joint venture. So that's also another option. The other one was a foreign acquisition. So foreign acquisition is more like foreign direct investment. You know, when you actually buy a company, this is a joint venture where you establish a new brand new company. So this is brand new, brand new company. And you decide on the structure, you decide on the, the logo and everything else. All right. So what are some other options? You have Let's say you have the, uh, this is country A, this is country B. You have a particular uh, innovation that you wanna make available to country B. In fact, they approached you. They said, well, you have this technology that we've seen and we would actually like to have that in our country. Can we work out a deal where you can allow us to use the, this innovation? And so 
this uh, company in country A, let's call it ABC again, will say, okay, we, we can allow you to use this innovation under these conditions. So what would happen is you would have a licensing agreement that 123, company 123 can use ABC's technology. And even in some cases, in a few cases, you have situations where that company can put their own name on your technology. Now that's a specific type of, of license. Uh, you have something called OEM, which is called uh, Original Equipment Manufacturer. So you essentially have technology coming from another source and they allow you to slap your name on it. I used to work for a computer company and we had OEM equipment. Somebody else made it, we slapped our name on it. And, you know, it, it of course makes the life cycle, it, it makes the uh, business cycle a lot quicker because you don't, you're not, ha not having to do the R&D and all the other stuff that comes with developing uh, technology on your own uh, because it's very expensive. And so licensing is a, is a, is a very uh, efficient way of gaining access to certain types of, of technology. But one of, the, one of the problems with licensing, and you may have seen a video I did on, on, um, on this, is um, sometimes licenses are, are violated. And what is one of the most common ways of violating a license? What are some ways you can think that licenses can be violated as we wind down. And you all could just blurt out in just whatever you think you say it, and that, that, that's how we learn. But what are some of the, the, the dangers of licensing your, your technology in, in another country? Now, bear in mind, you get royalties. So this is called residual income. You don't have to do anything. It, you, I mean, you get royalties from whatever um, proceeds they get. You get, you, you get a royalty because it's a license. So that's money, extra money that you have coming in through the license. But what's the one of the downsides? And I'm sorry if you all can't read my writing, but licensing. Um, you can lose control of it. In what way? You kind of have to like depend on that company that you have the licensing agreement with to actually complete the goals, like to go through with the plan. Okay. What else? The, the good, uh, good responses. Quality, maybe. Okay, we're getting into a lot of things. So let me, for the sake of time, we have to make sure that this company, I'm giving you a license. So you have to obviously honor the agreement. You have to honor the agreement. And you also should not, um, now this is, this is a hard one. Which means, okay, let's say you license technology to someone in another country and you give them the right to use it and they decide, oh, well, this is a nice technology. Let me um, get an engineer to look at it. And let me see if we can reverse engineer it and 
make it ourselves. And then you kind of liberally, um, you kind of liberally use the, uh, some of the specs and create your own product. And until so that company, ABC company finds out that you've um, violated the agreement. You've stolen, you've stolen their, 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 um, their technology. And um, now I, I do have to say that once technology leaves its borders, it's kind of hard for it not to be um, replicated. Now I don't mean stolen, but I mean someone looking at it and saying, okay, we're gonna make our own version of that. We're not going to steal their technology, but we're going to use our own technology so that we then can compete against this American company. But you have, you've had so many cases of copyright infringement. And again, some of you are going to be lawyers. And so you'll know about copyright law where people just take licenses and they just they violate them like the video segment that i that, that was in a, a a class review of uh danger dolan how all of these people were taking trademarks and they were um you know the um one example was they had shoes that had nike on them and they even had the swoosh symbol And then when you look at that, you know, okay, that's got to be Nike, right? That's what it's supposed to be. Uh, and then people buy it uh, because of the likeness. They buy it because of the likeness, which is why McDonald's in Life and Death said, well, hey, we think that they should shut that company down because we spent a lot of time building up this name and we don't want them benefiting off our trademarks. Uh, now that was a little different case because Jama the Jamaican restaurant had juris they had um, they were there first, and so they had um, priority over that that um, that jurisdiction. But yeah, this is one of the big big problems of people stealing your stuff. And if you're in a country that does not have strong laws and regulations, it's going to be tough to to go to that government and complain that somebody has stolen your your um i mean you spent hours you spent nights thinking up this design and you patented and everything else and then somebody steals it and uh it's interesting that there was a case of microsoft versus uh china well actually it was us versus china but us had uh filed a case on behalf of microsoft with the WTO and accused China of not having, um, not protecting foreign copyright because most of the the software uh, that was, uh, at that time, I think it was Windows that was loaded on computers were all copied. I think it was 99% of, of the software, Microsoft software in China was, was uh, pirated. It was copied and, and people just loaded on their computers. And so Microsoft complained and they stated that they were losing billions of dollars worth of revenue because the Chinese government had no laws in place to stop people from pirating. Uh, and certainly the WTO ruled in Microsoft's favor and China had to then come up with some laws and policies. I don't know if compensation was paid, but it was, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty big case. Uh, and China is all often cited as being one of those countries that's that uh, actually abets these crimes, you know, of copyright infringement. Now, one of the other things that we we talk about licensing. One of the most common forms of licensing is franchising. You, you obviously you have the golden arches. Everybody knows. Um, it's ironic that coming to America is coming out in a few weeks, uh, Eddie Murphy movie where you had, um, <laughs> you had McDowell's, which was, uh, 
stolen um, trademarks of McDonald's. And they were basically just a knockoff, um, selling some of the same menu items with small changes. If you haven't seen Coming to America, the old one, go see it before you see this new movie, because it's there's a lot of cross-cultural stuff in there, and um, uh, it's it's very very um, it's very funny. And Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall. So let's say you're a franchisee and you're in a foreign country and you have the right to use the golden arches. Of course, you've got the uh, red, red and gold, right? But let's say you decide that you want to do some creative um, stuff with the menu and you want to start selling crabs, lobsters, in McDonald's. Now, because you, you are a franchisee, there's a certain license you are granted, but you can't just do anything you want with that license. It has to be within a certain um, parameter, and you have to get permission. If they feel in McDonald's in Oak Brook, Illinois, feels that that is in line with McDonald's mission, then they may give you permission to sell seafood at a McDonald's or to sell different products at a McDonald's. But you can't take liberties with that license, otherwise they'll take the they'll take the um, they'll take the store from you and you'll you'll forfeit your rights. And so but these are some of the, the methods. Uh, all of these are mentioned in uh, chapter eight. It's a lot of good examples in here, and uh, certainly you have to be careful with joint ventures because there are some unscrupulous people that will steal your business. Um, one case, and it's we're at the hour, but this very quickly, there's an American entrepreneur who goes over to Russia, meets um, a Russian business person, and they establish a joint venture. This Russian business person said, Months down the road, they said, well, this is not working out, and I offered to buy your half of the business. So the American says, well, yeah, we are having a tough go, so how much you want? So they settle on a, an agreement. The Russian pays the American. The American goes back, and the Russian turns that company around into a million-dollar empire. The Russian was just trying to get rid of them. And they knew, okay, I, they knew the secret to making this a successful business. The American didn't know what was going on, sold the business, and the Russian made millions out of it. <laughs> so you have to be careful uh, and vet those that you're going into business with overseas because you know you can be you can certainly be a victim um, of that.